Uh, there's any questions about the homework. I wanted to go over one part, which was 1B, assuming you implemented these definitions in a computer program. I didn't have a chance to actually look at the homework. Sometimes I get a chance to look at them before I get to class. But I didn't today. So uh, I didn't see what problems people had in homework. But are there any questions beyond 1B, which I know I want to go over? Because it's mostly just algebra, I think, for most of it. Right? Well, algebra is a um, here, we have these two equivalent definitions, which you showed they were equivalent, of the sigmoid function. And the question is, why would you use any particular one of them in practice? Leo. Um, why would we choose one over the other when we're using a computer program with floating point or anything? Um, well, when, yeah, if, uh, Give me an example of an input for which one or the other would be more accurate. Um, or from a friend. Uh, okay, next door. Um, that could deal with um, if the numbers get very large, you have. Um, so give me an example of a large number. Well, you give e to like 100. 100. Okay, so let's say sigma of 100. We try and evaluate this. What are we going to get? Very e, small e to the minus 100 is going to be very small. So it's going to be 1 over 1 plus a very small number, which is going to be close to the, close to 1, right? But if we evaluate over here, what's the numerator going to be? Like how large? E to 100. And what will happen if we try that in Python or C or Java or anything else? Anyone? Did anyone try it? Yeah. You get like an overflow? Yeah, you get an overflow. You can't represent that number. The exponent's too big. Right? Because we've only got uh, I don't know how many digits for the for the exponent. Eight maybe? I think. Something like that. So anyway, overflow in this case. Overflow in both the numerator and denominator. So we'll end up with it as some sort of a not a number, which is not very fun. I know the question. I read this with Noah and didn't get an overflow, and I used like a thousand. Is there? <laughs> I know doing it in Python directly, okay. you do, okay. because I went ahead and did that in like eighty, and it failed. <laughs> I did find that one of them, like when you got a thousand or five thousand or something, one of them was actually lost. When that part hardly matters too much. Uh, I don't know how that could be. So you actually, you didn't evaluate sigmoid. You evaluated one over one plus. I don't have any good reason for why that would be true. So something good to look into. So I have a question. question. I'm going to ask, like, is, there, is there ever a problem where you get like one plus and then the number is so small that it's like, it just rounds to one? Because it's like one plus e to the yeah, this is basically one plus epsilon, and if epsilon gets small enough, this is going to be one plus one, or sorry, one plus zero. Okay. So this could very well round to one, which means whole thing would round to one, which is fine. Okay. Right. So yeah, we could have underflow isn't so bad because basically you're just losing a, a tiny, tiny bit. Right. If you want to do you know one divided by epsilon, that begins to be. Uh, and then what about, so So that says we just want to always use this, right? No, give me a, give me an X. Give someone else give me an X, why not? Because you gave me a good X. Morgan. Negative 100. Yeah, negative exactly. So E to negative 100. This will be 1 plus overflow. So. And here we'll get correctly E to negative 100, very small. Very small plus one, and so we're going to get something new here, which is what we, what we want. Right? Does that make sense? So when you're actually writing the sigmoid function, you look at x, and if it's positive, you do one thing; if it's negative, you do it. You don't look for is it too big or too small. You just look positive or negative, and use the appropriate. If you were implementing this, this is of course already done, and NumPy or TensorFlow or PyTorch. Questions? 
All right, so here's what we're going to do. At five minutes before the end of class, we're going to do the quiz. Okay. So at the very end of class on uh, Wednesday, I talked about test decks. And I just wanted to go over that again because it's so important. So we've already been talking about training validation sets, and now we, we introduce test sets. Um, not everyone, there's not universal agreement on these names. Everyone agrees this is the training set. But some people call the validation set the test set, and then vice versa. So just be aware of, of, of what you're looking at. Uh, the training set, right, we use to train the model. So it's the one we're going to be doing gradient descent on. Right. And the loss. Should be decreasing. Right. You can almost always continue to at least asymptotically and keep that way. The validation is what we use for what then? Um, the validation is what we use to um, avoid overfitting. So we okay. So we use it to avoid overfitting, and therefore, what are we? We're going to avoid overfitting. Really, what we're doing is testing for overfitting, right? When we find where we're fitting, what do we do? adjust the penalty factor that we're using, we might adjust the momentum, we might adjust all that sort of thing. So we might go through and do 10 or 100 or 500 different tries at various model strength and hyperparameters. So we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until eventually we've got one that has good validation. That's kind of like he hacking if you're familiar with that term. Okay, so in social sciences, you use a p-value to determine whether some hypothesis you have, right? So you uh, uh, do some test, and you're trying to get a p-value of less than 0.05. Roughly, but I'm not doing it correctly, a less than 1 out of 20 chance that it was due to, to that your effect was due to random chance. Okay. The problem is, if you do one experiment, and you look at the p-value, it's less than 0.05, then yes, it's only one out of 20 chance. But if you do 30 experiments, you're going to probably find one that matches that p-value. Same kind of idea here, right, is if you keep trying and trying and trying and trying and trying, you may be now overfitting to the validation set, data set, because you've tried all the things you can to make this work really well in the validation data set. And so you no longer the loss here, or the, the accuracy, is being overstated as to how it will generalize, generalize, right? It's certainly unlikely that we'll do better on random other data than we did on this set that we carefully set for. So that's why we'll do a final one time loss and accuracy uh, check before we ship our model out. And we say to ourselves, and we promise, we'll only do it one time. Because as soon as we say, oh, wow, that didn't really generalize well, we better go try again, then we're starting to tune towards this. Does that make sense? So this is sometimes called the holdback. Because you're holding it back. Any questions? So 
today, finally, we get to talk about neural networks. Uh, let's put up our diagram from day one and day two, and probably every day, right? Where we have our x coming in, we have our function, this goes down to the big y hat, y is coming in here, we have our loss function, this goes over to our optimizer, this goes up and adjusts our weights, which feeds into our right? parameters for it. So, here is where we are now. We're going to be working in that app for the neural networks. In fact, I think it's fair to say for the rest of the semester, we're going to be working with there and there, the loss function. So we will do some adjustments for loss functions to learn different kinds of things. So if we're doing uh, binary classification, we're going to use the loss function we've already used, right? The binary process we're going to. But for new types of things, we're meaning to come up with new loss functions. But mainly, today, this is where we are. Okay? We are going to leave the land of polynomials. But first, let's just start with polynomial again. <laughs> let's say we have f of x equals uh, Well, I'm going to call it, let's say, mx plus b. Right. But I'm going to extend this a bit. I'm going to say we actually have two inputs. So I'm going to have two inputs, x1 and x2. And we'll make this be, I'm not going to use it. I'm going to change my mind, I'm sorry. We're going to make this wx. And this one's going to be w1x1 plus w2x2. And I apologize again because I'm going to change the W's now. So they went from M to W, and now I'm going to make them A. That's my final, my final answer. Okay. If we had multiple X's, you know, N X's, we could have A1X1, A2X2, all the way to A. What I'd like to do is rewrite this and matrix form just so we don't have to have this extra summation. So I'm going to say f of x bar, let's just say, right? it's a vector, is going to be equal to xw plus b. And I'm going to define what w is in just a second. So we're going to make x Let's look at a particular example. So one row, two columns, two values. And so this is going to be multiplication of a one by two matrix by a, well, what does this W mean? Like how many rows in this W? Two, two rows. So let's make this, oh, I don't know, let's call it A1 and A2. In fact, I'm not going to use numbers yet. Go back. So all of you who use pencil are very happy to use pencil right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to be x1, x2. And this then is going to be A1 and A2. Plus B. And so when we multiply this out, right, we take each row, like we have one row, we have one column, so we multiply out x1a1 plus x2a2. So this equals uh, a1x1 plus a2x2 plus b. So we get our same linear result here. This is a building block that we're going to be using for neural networks. Okay, this matrix multiplication plus the addition of what's often called a bias. This just ensures 
that if our x's come in zeros, we don't end up with a zero. So the nice part about this is we could easily extend this to n values, let's say, coming in for our x's. And all we need to do is make this matrix of coefficients or weights look. So we can have one input, one output. X times W plus B. W is just a one by one matrix, or it's just a scalar, right? The same. Um, uh, equation works for that. We can also support multiple outputs. So let's look at that. So let's say we want to have x of f of x1, x2 yields some y hat 1, y hat 2, y hat 3. Which is reasonable. We're making, we want to come out with three values instead of one value. Maybe these are going to end up being the, uh, if we're trying to do multi-class classification, this might be a number that tells us how, li how likely it is that it's a dog, how likely it is that it's a cat, and how likely it is that it's a bird. Okay. And we'll shoot those through sigmoids to turn them into probabilities. But how do we represent that? I can just say equals. And we're going to have an array again. And how many columns in the array? Sorry, how many rows in the array? Two, because we got two columns here. We have to have two rows, right? So this is a one by two. So therefore, this is a two by something. And the question is, what's the something? It's going to be three because we have three y's here. So we can just look and say this is going to be, let's say, a1, a2, a3, a4, a5, a6. multiplication, we get the 1 by 3. So we'll get a1x1 plus a2x2. And then is the next entry. Right? So that's the first entry. Next entry is this one. a3x1 plus a4x2. And the final entry a five x one plus a six x two. What are we missing? B. So let's add B. Plus, well, we know it's got to look like a one by three, right? So this is going to have to be a one by three. B one, B two, B three, let's say. So this is a fundamental building block of a neural network. And what we'd like to do in a neural network is compose together multiple functions. So we're going to compose together, let's say, we might have x coming in, and then we might have some f1, and we feed that into an f2, and we feed that into an f3, and this is finally our y hat. And each of these f's might have a different matrix and would have a different matrix and a different bias. And they might even be different sizes. So let's say this is a 1 by 2 coming in, and this is a 1 by 3 coming out. Well, in here, this might be coming out as a 1 by what? 
Could it be two? Could be. Could it be five? Could be. Could be whatever number we want. It depends on how big the matrix is in here that we're dealing with, right? So this is a one by something, and this is a one by something. Let's make this one by fifteen, and we'll make this one by five. That can certainly work. Who gets to decide this? We get to decide this. This is part of our designing architecture. There is a problem, though. And that problem is this operation of xw plus b is closed under composition. Show you what I mean by that. Let's say we have f1 of f2 of x. Okay? The composition. So this will be, right, f2 of x is just going to be x w2 plus b2, right? That's the result of this. And if we then apply f1 to it, that's going to be. this times w1 plus b1. Is that clear? Questions? So let's just multiply that out. So this equals x w2 w1 plus b2 w1 plus b1. This is just a matrix. It's a constant matrix that we can even add to B1. So we can call this B prime, let's say. And here, right, we were applying this matrices like this. Our matrix multiplication was x times w2 and then the result of that times w1. But matrix multiplication is see, not commutative associative. And so we can choose to instead do right, x w2 w1 is the same thing as x w2 w1. So this equals x. And this is just a matrix, sub w prime. <coughs> So by doing a composition, we end up with two applications of the form xw plus b, different w's and different b's. And we end up with some xw prime plus b prime. So there's no reason to have two matrices and two biases. Biases, you can get, get away with just one matrix and one bias. So we're ending up in the same spot we were. We don't gain any power by composing. So that's a problem. We have a solution. And the solution is between f1 and f2, throw in some nonlinear function. If we throw in some nonlinear function between it, then all of a sudden we gain power. So let's bring that picture over here. So x. Coming in to f, we're going to come into some, I'm going to put in f1, and I'm going to say g1, and then f2, and then g2, and then that would be our y hat. And of course, we could make this as long as, as, as long as we want, as many, as deep as we want. And this is, in fact, where the term deep learning comes from because the network becomes deep. So give me an example of, Brandon, a nonlinear function that you might use. The sine function. Sine function. Or polynomial. Yeah, we could use polynomial. Is not linear, that's true. It's not, it's, it is nonlinear, and that could do it. Give me one we've already used. 
It's right here. Sigma. Right. So G could be sigma. And by the way, we could choose different G's for each of these. So in fact, if we were doing binary classification, this would be a sigma. If we were doing multi-label, this might also be a sigma because F coming out of here might have multiple Y's coming out. And remember, for multi-label, we want to independently say for each one of the labels, what's the probability that this is this label? What's the probability that this is this label? What's the probability that this is this label? So sigmoid is one possibility. Uh, I never gave you the name of the multi-class. Remember, multi-class, we're trying to predict multiple classes, but only one of them. So we want to predict probabilities where the sum totals one. So this was right, e to the x, e to the x, actually it's really e to the y hat one, e to the y hat two, e to the y hat three. And we divide these, we create a total, and then we divide by the total. Another G we could have. And G is called an activation function. So we do our matrix multiply plus the bias, and then we apply an activation function. We have our output activation function, very often sigmoid. Softmax sometimes. Could be other things. Yeah. Yeah. The multi-class classification, so we have like that certain values for each uh, each x1, x2, x3, and we're trying to get in a, a total of range from 0 to 1 for that one. We want each value to be in the range 0 to 1, and we want the total to be 1, to, to sum the 1. And does the exponential, does it mean that we pull the, the labels apart slightly as well? Yeah, we're definitely saying large x's lead to extremely large e to the x's. Right? So it tends to pull those more towards one. All right, so sigmoid, we could be soft max. Uh, one that used to be used a lot was 10h. So 10H is a sigmoid type function, but it's centered around zero vertically. So 
and looks like that, between negative 1 and 1. So sigmoid gives you numbers between 0 and 1. Tan H gives you numbers between negative 1 and 1. That was the go-to activation function in the middle of your neural network up until a few years ago. And what is used almost all the time these days is ReLU. ReLU stands for Rectified Linear Unit. All right, rectified. Well, I actually looked it up today because I'd never known before this. So a rectifier is used, let's say, in converting AC to DC. If you have a uh, uh, alternating current that looks like this, let's say, the rectifier cuts out all the negative parts. So that it looks like that. A rectified linear unit is a linear unit that cuts out the negative parts. So it looks like this. When x is positive, it's the identity function. And when x is negative, it's 0. So the definition of it is very simple. Value of x equals x if x is greater than or equal 0 and 0 of x. What makes it work so well? Uh, here's part of it, and this is getting ahead. But part of what we need to do in order to make this work is to be able to calculate our derivatives. Right. And we need to be able to take some sort of an error here in the loss and take it back through these functions, because we're going to be doing these derivatives using the chain rule to get back to here. Let's say we're looking at a weight back here. We need to make sure that the derivative here, from here to here, from the loss into here, is large enough. It doesn't disappear. Because if it disappears, we won't be able to make any changes here. The derivative of the ReLU, as long as x is greater than or equal to 0, is what? 1. So that derivative of 1 is nice. If we look over at the tan h, for example, if x happens to be large, what's our derivative going to be? Really close to 0. Which means, because of our chain rule, we're going to be doing this multiplication of derivatives, one of our terms in our multiplication is going to be a number very close to 0. Which means, we're not going to change this very much. So it's going to be really slow to train. That is uh, ahead of us. But we'll be talking about that the next two lectures, but very good question. Um, and I'm going to just throw one other. There are a number of slight variations on ReLU. One is called a leaky ReLU, where instead of being totally zero here, uh, it is a small number times x. So the derivative is whatever that small number is, maybe 0.01 or something. That has the advantage, even if x is negative, we don't lose our derivative. We still have a little bit of derivative that we can push back. So we're going to put in some activation functions. We might say g2 equals sigmoid, and g1 equals ReLU. And all of a sudden now, we are not stuck with this linear transformation. Already. In fact, a two-level deep network like this, assuming our matrices are large enough, and that's a large assumption, assuming our matrices are large enough, is a universal function approximator. That is, any function I can approximate to as close as you ask me to, as long as you let me let these weights get exponential. 
that is the size of the links. What's the size of this here? Right? This input might be, let's say, a one by two. And if you give me a one by you know, 10 to the 10th, then I can do a pretty good job approximating whatever I want to. Right? If this is one by 10 to the 10th, what's the output of G? The size of the matrix. Is also one by 10 to the 10th. And the input to this is 10 to the 10th times, let's say, 1. If this is by 1, if this is going to a 1. Um, what is the one I see? This is the how big our uh, matrix is. So, sorry, I don't want one times 10. Do I want? So if this is one by two, first off, that has to be a two for this to match. Right? Here's how the way I want to think about it. We can look at the, at the size of the input coming in. That's fixed. That's whatever our x is. So if we're doing like we're going to do in a moment, recognizing handwritten digits, we're going to have. I don't remember how big it is. I think it's 120 by 120, maybe. So it's a 120 by 120 array of pixel values. So that is what? Uh, about 10 to the fourth, something like that. Right. Number of input values. The number of output values from f, we get to decide. We could have the same number, we could have smaller, we could have greater. That's just part of what we get to decide. And that's really just controlling how big is this matrix that we're doing multiply by. But we have a size coming out of here, and then we have a size coming out of here. And for every one of our layers, so we're going to call this layer one, and we're going to call this layer two, we get to decide the size of that layer. That is the number of outputs. That's all a neural network is. This matrix multiply, followed by an activation function, and we put it in a bunch of layers. Now, sometimes it will get a little more complicated. Sometimes we will actually have, let's say, we might have two functions you know, at this layer that then feed into this one. Uh, sometimes we might have a uh, We'll get into some fancier architectures, but that's basically it. Questions? Um, so when you say uh, this two layers is universal function approximate, is it going to approximate like every function? Let me back up a second. It's not, I'm not saying that it's learnable. What I am saying is if you gave me a function, the inputs and the outputs, I can basically tune and set some appropriate weights such that it's going to be as close as you want for any given axis to the associated ones. So my y hats will be close. And it may be ranges, so, so, so the actual way the approximation kind of works is you say, okay, if x is in the range 3 to 4, then y should be 6. And I'll say, okay, within the range three and four, I can give you, you know, 5.5 or 5.7, whatever you want. And basically, you would just sort of construct this giant matrix to say, okay, for range three or four, we're going to make it be this. For four to five, we're going to make it be this. For five to six, we're going to make it be this. So you're you're just piecewise constructing this thing for all of the all of the outputs. So it's a brute force approach, but this has enough power at least to do it. Let me just point. Let me turn this into oh, just some function calls and name a couple. 
all those things. So I am going to do this. I'm going to say that A So Z at 1. Z is the output of that. And we're going to also have an A, which is the output of G. This is A for activation. So Z and my brackets here, the superscript brackets, are going to mean the layer. So this is layer 1. So what's Z equal given it's the output of that? What does it look like? What's our formula for F? Oh? Um, it's not here anymore, but we yeah. have it. Is it going to be X, uh, W plus B? X, W plus B. And it's going to be the W from the first layer mm -hmm. plus B for the first layer. A output of layer one, right? This is like our intermediate value for layer one coming out of that. And to get our final output from layer one, we need to apply our activation function to Z. And then we do the same thing for layer two. So that equals, except it's not X anymore. What is it? doing this calculation, if we were doing it by hand, we, would be, we wouldn't be completely doing it by hand, right? We would not be doing this in Python and trying to write matrix multiplication by ourselves, right? What would we use instead? Say again? TensorFlow, or we could use NumPy if we wanted, right? But we're sure not going to go write matrix multiplication stuff by hand, so NumPy would be, where would be good. And TensorFlow is better for one big reason. It has three letters. Anyone know what those three letters are? I'll give you a hint. <coughs> GPU. Because NumPy doesn't work on GPUs, but TensorFlow does and PyTorch does. And so, what you want is all of this to be working on a GPU. We'll come back to the GPU stuff in a little bit. I want to show you, actually, an example. So this is from the uh, I don't know how to pronounce French. 
Cholet? Cholet? But anyway, the uh, smaller book. And what I did, these are all available in the GitHub repository. Um, I took basically what was in the book and I made a few slight modifications so it works in TensorFlow 2.0, which by the way was released today. And so what that involved is a little bit of work to tell Colab to use 2.0, the 2.0. So they have a TensorFlow version command to get it to Colab. Normally, if it were your machine, you would install TensorFlow 2.0 and use that. But well, that comes with stuff pre-installed, so it needs to know what you're use. Um, and because something happened earlier this month, there was a library they depended on that got updated and then stopped working. So we installed a number of good version that makes it work until TensorFlow itself is fixed. So let me look at this just a second. I'm going to turn off the GPU, and I'm going to look at that. And what we're doing is uh, MNIST. So this is, I'm sorry, I said like 120 pixels by 120 pixels. This is like 28 pixels by 28 pixels. So little things that look like, you know, two. So this was used by the post office in order to automatically sort handwritten um, like zip codes and stuff. So, Keras has uh, in this data. So it actually loads it from somewhere or other and downloads it. And now we have a training and test images and labels. And train and test, we really probably mean by that train and validate, I would think. Oh, yeah. But what we have are, so our training images, are 60,000 samples, and each one is 28 by 28. So, and then the labels are either, what do you think the labels are? Zero from that. Yeah, that's exactly what And the test images, there are 10,000 of them. And here's our model. So can you guys read that? A little bigger. So our model, make it a little smaller. Our model is a sequential model. We're just doing things in order. And in our network, we are adding a dense layer. So dense just means we have a matrix that is all filled in. Okay, so it's fully connected, so to speak. Every input in here affects every output in here. 512. That's the size of that layer. Or what some of them call the number of units. We'll get to that in why, but it's the size of the layer. So what's coming in is of size. What is it again? 20 by 20? 28 by 28. So we've got around 900 uh, inputs. And what comes out of the first layer is how many outputs? Five. Okay, so we've got five full coming out. Our activation is relative. We know what that is now, right? So we do a matrix multiply by a matrix that is, right? So let's look at what this is coming in. This is 28 by 28, which gets flattened just down to whatever that is. 900, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it 900 even though it's not really that. So that's what's coming in. We've got a weight matrix here, which is one by 900, so this is 900 by, parameters we have in our model so far? 
we've got almost 500,000 parameters. Because these are individual weights in this matrix that we're learning. Okay? So it's a lot bigger than that. How many do we do? 10 at most, I think. Or we do a 10 degree polynomial, 11. So, yeah, a little, little bit bigger. And let's not forget our B, right? I mean, that's another. What's that look like? 512. So that's the first one. And our input is 28 by 28, right, as a, as a number. So that's approximately 900. Uh, and that's what the input looks like. So that's all we really need to know for this dense layer. And then the next layer is a soft max output. So that is, it's a probability where the total sum will end What's the comma after 28 or 28? Is there some sort of optional parameter that wants to go in there? Or? Uh, I always get confused on that. Um, <coughs> It may cause reshaping, and I'm not. I'm not sure. This this may be the distinction between in NumPy you can have like a five comma or a five comma one, where it actually knows what the one is. Sorry, I don't know yet. I think that's just a thing in Python where it's expecting this shape to be a tuple, um, and if you put a comma after it, then it knows that it's a tuple. That's true. That's that's right. If you didn't have a comma it would think it was just a parenthesized scalar. And so that makes it a tuple, but presumably a tuple still size one. Yeah. With, with one element. So thank you very much. Yeah, that's exactly what it is now I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, now I know it. Um, <laughs> but it does make sense. Why 10 here? Come on. Why 10? Why 10? Why not 20 or 5 or 50? Uh, because that's the number of Y hats that we want to get. Yeah. That's number Y hats we want to get because they represent. Um, no. Y10. It's because we have 10 fingers. Mm -hmm. Because we use a decimal system because it's zero through nine. It's a zero through nine digits. So the first one is going to be our probability is a zero, the second probability one, the last one probability is a nine. So this is uh, obviously like a function of like the current variable we're working in, finding class five numbers, of course there are 10 numbers, but if you want to sort of get like a continuous output uh, instead of like a binary like sort of computation, obviously you're using soft matches and probabilities and stuff like that, but how would we like, how would we structure that later if you want to get a continuous output? If you want like, if you were doing regression like house prices or something like yeah. that, you could just use a linear activation as your last one. Okay. Um, or identity, actually, is you know, linear with it. I was going to ask you, when you do um, problems like this, why don't you have one that's like not A or B, or B or like not 0 through 9? You do not have like a. You could, that'd be well for You could. It, uh, in this particular problem, we know they're all supposed to be digits. Even though, in some cases, you as a human would be hard pressed to decide, is this a 3 or an A? So, uh, but these classifiers are so good that all they don't understand these days. Not ours, ours isn't gonna be great, but uh, the good ones, it's like, the only ones they get wrong are the ones you and I would get wrong. They probably get some right, we get wrong. And you may say, how is it wrong if we go? <laughs> and it's because of, we all voted, you know, 20 of us voted, and 13 of us thought it was a three, and only, you know, the rest thought it was a three. It must have been a three. You had a question? Yeah, so what does the tank stand for? Is it like how many characters that we're trying to identify in multiple class? It's, well, from the point of view of this parameter here, it is just how many outputs are there. So it's the size of this output, which is going to be 1 by 10. Okay. How we interpret it is up to us, and we're going to be using a loss function to do that. Right, we'll have a loss function, which is this categorical cross entropy, and we'll be comparing that against our y's, which are the ground truth against what the are. Do you have questions on the back? So there is not much to this, is there? 
How do we train it? We already know how to train it. It's with derivatives. It's just gonna be more complicated in terms of how we actually calculate it. But basically, we're gonna do half a million derivatives. <laughs> okay? Plus, we've got over here, how big is W? Uh, five, twelve, five, twelve, right. So we'll add in another 5,000, which is hardly anything, right? All right, let's look at this some more. We are going to compile it. We use an optimizer of RMS prop. Gee, I wish I knew what that meant. Wait, we do. We don't have to learn anything new about, about optimizers. Okay. We're going to use categorical cross entropy. We know about that too. Right. This is basically the sum of the y sub i's log of all that. And the metrics are the things we want to keep track of. We want to know not only the loss, we want to know accuracy. That is, if you're looking at the predictions you would make for all the training samples, do they match the label or not? So as long as the maximum one matches the label, that's the one we're going to predict, and that's, that's what's good. Um, the inputs actually come in at 0 to 255. We're going to scale them to 0 to 1. There's no inherent reason I think we need to do that. It would be interesting to try that without. Question? Every single time it's wx plus b. Okay. F is never anything but wx plus b. Okay. okay. Of course, w for this layer, which is of this form, and a separate w for this layer. Yeah. How much possible that to be a nonlinear layer? Well, these layers are nonlinear because our g's in both cases are nonlinear. Yeah, but you never have that f1. Like f1 will never. F, F1 is always Wx plus B. Always, always, always. All right, so we divide by 255 to turn them into floating points from integers and scale them to one, 0 to 1. Shouldn't really matter. Um, we convert our labels to categorical. That is basically making them one half. Our labels come in as a number between 0 and 9. We need to convert it into a vector I guess not this way. This way, uh, that's one one in there and other wise zeros. So for number six, we're going to have five zeros, six zeros, and a one. The right number is zeros and a one, and the remaining number is zeros. And then fit actually does the work. So let me actually run all this stuff. So what's it doing? Well, now it's fitting. So how many epochs are we going to do? Five. We know what an epoch is, right? It's one run over all the training data. How big is our batch size? 128. That's our, our mini batch size, right? So we're going to take our 60,000 of these and do them 128 at a time. These are our x's. Those are our y's. We can see our loss is decreasing. We're going to have to scroll over to see the accuracy. Notice it takes about seven or six seconds per epoch. So our accuracy is 98.8%. That sounds great, doesn't it? And what's even better, we could keep going and get it more and more accurate. Except we don't really care about uh, just the training set. We want to know about the validation set. And this is a good example of where the naming between validation and test can be confusing depending on who you're talking to. Or, so what kind of data distribution does this multi-layer algorithm work the best for? For example, if we have a sinusoid distribution of data points, wouldn't it be better just to use a sine function? Yes, if you know things about your model, you could theoretically take advantage of that. Um, this is just this is a general purpose learning technique that we use to learn all sorts of functions. And a lot of times we have no idea what the underlying model of this is. But we can approximate sine functions if we want to some degree of accuracy. Um, so our accuracy is 98%. Well, sorry, we executed this one. They didn't execute this one yet. Maybe this time it's all off. Who knows? 
Uh, same amount, 98%. So 98% in like not a lot of code, and this was an immensely difficult problem 15 years ago. Let's try it again. However, let us switch to using a GPU. <laughs> So nothing should be much quicker. Right? We've got to still do all that startup stuff. But if we look at our training loop, so we're like three times faster. There is a lot that we're going to learn on how to do this backpropagation. A lot. Some. You're not going to be doing backpropagation by hand, except on exams. Um, but in real life, you're not. I want to look at the GPU for a moment, and then I'm going to come back to a, another example. So let's say. We have a mini batch. This is a mini mini batch because it only has two training samples in it. So we're going to use we have x1 equals I don't know four five six, and it's x2 equals two three eight, and our associated y's y1 maybe is equal to three. And y2 equals 4. So I'm going to set up a0. Remember, a0 is just our x. That's what we're going to feed in. To be a combination of those two, in fact, I'm going to feed in 4, 5, 6, 2, 3, 8. So what I'm basically doing is taking x, and I'm going to put in x1, that kind of takes up the whole row, and then below that, x2. It takes up the whole row, and I can keep doing that for my entire mini batch. And what I'm going to try to do is do this wx plus b once on all those on, on both of these samples, but in general once on 128 samples. Let's say. So let's say I do x w plus b. So I calculate z1. So that equals four, five, six, two, three, eight. And I'm going to just look at this one layer. So this is a really simple neural network, a single layer. Um, and so I know my y hat should just be a single number. So my question is, what should this matrix look like? So this is a two by three, right? What should this matrix look like? Give me the first three by one because I want a single one. Okay. So this is going to be, uh, let's just call it W1, W2, W3. So when we do this matrix multiply, we're going to end up with a two by one, right? Since we have two rows here. So we're going to end up with 4w1 plus 5w2 plus 6w3, and here 2w2 plus 3, 2w1 plus 3w2 plus 8w3. So we have calculated f on both of our training examples in our mini batch at once. Now, if we're using NumPy, it's going to take longer with two of these than it is with one. But if we're using a GPU and this fits in memory, it's just as fast to do two of these as it does one. Because the way that the GPU works, it's this Cindy, 
single instruction, multiple data. That is, it's executing the same instructions, but on a bunch of data in parallel. And that's ideally suited for matrix multiplication. So it costs us no more to do this. Right? It costs us no more to run a batch of one than it does a batch of 128. Can we run everything in our entire batch? Can we run all 60,000 at once? What are we limited by? It's kind of a combination of memory and cores. Mostly memory on the GPU. So what's got to be on the memory on the GPU? We've got to have every one of these weights. Okay. So we're going to have all, what, half a million here, 50K. And we're going to look at models that are going to have millions and millions of weights, like 50 million weights, let's say. So that only leaves so much for our batch. Uh oh. Let's just. All right. <laughs> Wait, what is going on? How does that work? All right. I have no idea what my mic might be sending me, but history tells me it's not good to have that Does that make sense? Okay, we're not going to learn much more about GPUs, but just know that it's really good at these matrix multiplies. And we can take advantage of that by stacking all of our S. And then when we apply our G, the same thing will happen. We'll basically be applying, let's say, a ReLU in parallel or sigmoid in parallel. So, so what you'll find is you want to keep increasing the batch size if you're on a GPU until you run out of GPU memory. Normally you double it. It's often you know a power of two. So one twenty was it one twenty or one? It was one twenty-eight. It was 128. Mm -hmm. So that's a reasonable number, but we could up to fifty-six or five twelve depending on the GPU again. Yeah. I need to show you a picture now of how you'll see a neural network everywhere else in the world. Okay? So you need to So let's say you had a x1, x2 coming in, and y hat 1, y hat 2, y hat 3 coming out. Here's how this would normally be presented. You have x1 and x2 coming in. You have, so let's say we have two layers, and this has, the first layer has a size of 3, and the second layer has a size of the second layer at the size of. Um, Rachel, any guesses? How many outputs layer two is going to have? Which is another name for what's the size of? Um, wait, what was the size of the. Uh, we have two inputs. I'm going to have to say, I don't know what this size is going to be. This is going to be a size of something. And now, what's the second layer is going to be? So this is layer two, and this is layer one. Uh, I'll make this one be two as well. And the question is, what's this size going to be? Um, do you want three outputs? Yep. So, three outputs is um, something like three Yeah, it's going to be three. The size will be three. And in fact, we know now it's going to be a two by three, right? Because the output of here is two, and the output of here is three, so our weight matrix is going to be two by three. And here, the weight matrix is going to be a two by two. But that's not how we represent it. We don't look at matrices for this. We're going to look at pictures. So the pictures are going to be, uh, let's call it a neuron, or a node, or a, an element. And we're going to have x1 feeds into here, and here, and x2 feeds into here, and here. And we're going to have a weight. Let's call this weight 1, 1, and 1, 2. The first number is going to be where it's coming from, the second number where it's going to. And this is going to be 2, 1, and 2, 2. 
And in this node, we're going to do a weighted sum. What are we going to do a weighted sum of? This times this plus this times this. Okay, so let's make this bigger. So this is going to be x1 w11 plus x2 w21 plus we have a, a b in here, b1. So this guy is going to have its own b and it's going to use these weights instead of these weights. This represents the matrix multiplication. And if we do xw plus b, if we look at a particular element of this and add the particular b here, that's going to be this value. So this is just, in some sense, an exploded matrix multiplication where we're looking at all the elements from the previous level and all the elements at this level and have arrows bunch of arrows between them and draw little weights on them. <coughs> but we can represent all four of these inside just a two by two matrix. And the right half of this is our activation function. So the left half is basically the summation. It's, it's basically doing Wx plus b, but only for this one element. And then, I'm about to erase this exploded one, and then show you the next layer. So the next layer has three nodes in it, and has now nine, six arrows with six weights on them. which of course are different weights than here. Six weights, because it's three by two. We can write those six weights in a matrix, or we can write them as little labels on these arrows, which are so complicated, I think. And matrices are so much easier to look at. So when you look at neural networks, this is what you'll usually see, is a diagram that looks like this with maybe a bunch of levels to it. And I think in some sense it obscures the matrix multiplication that's going on. Because all it is is matrix multiplication and add a bias, and then apply an activation function, and then do a different matrix, different B, apply an activation function. It may be different. There you go. So why do we do this? Historical, I guess, partially because we were inspired by neurons of the brain and kind of looking individually. The other reason is historically, people were looking at networks about this big. Okay? Because they just couldn't, uh, they had to learn how to train them and so on, and then the computers were so slow that it was slow to simulate, and so you couldn't do much bigger than, you know, about this. And so therefore, if you look at this, it makes sense. That I wouldn't want to write half a million little W's in a diagram like this. That would be unpleasant. It turns out I've gone over a little bit, so we'll just do the quiz, the first thing. Wednesday, but I still have a couple minutes that I don't want to lose. Uh, and we will look at this diagram as looking at back, pro back propagation, because when we're looking at one particular weight, we're trying to find the derivative of, with respect to, so the, so the partial L, partial W11, this guy, this diagram can give us some useful intuitions that we won't necessarily get when we just look at the matrix. So we will come back to this picture as we're looking, right, this is all basically feeds into, right, these are our y hat, and this goes into our loss function that takes y and y hat. And basically then we're taking the derivative of the loss with respect to, let's say, this guy, the derivative of this guy, the derivative of respect to this guy, but we have some fancy ways to not have to calculate them one by one by one. We'll basically do some dynamic programming um, to make that calculation faster and to do matrix calculations of it. 
so that it gets nice and GPU sped up. Any questions for that? So neural nets, complicated? Less complicated than you thought? More complicated than you thought? Anyone? Jack, did you and your hand went up? A little less complicated than I thought. Okay. But, uh, definitely, I feel like definitely you have to like, also understand more to become even less complicated. Sure. Same thing? So, a bit both. Like, both? I thought it would be less complicated and thought it was more complicated than I would have thought. Okay. All right. Well, just as a warning, back propagation. Um, it boils down to the chain rule plus dynamic programming. But since someone has sort of invented it, it has its own name. But all it really is is the chain rule and a dynamic programming approach to doing the calculations. Um, but we are going to have to look at some derivatives and some different matrix multiplications and stuff like that. We'll be looking at A's and Z's and A primes and Z primes. See you on Wednesday.